breaking the wall of global economic crises. How macroeconomics shape the financial architecture of tomorrow. Helene Ray, London Business School. On the 9th of November 1989, I was studying mathematics in central France, struggling with very difficult problem sets. I remember being elated by the news and thinking that, yes, there was more to life than dynamic calculus. Guten Abend, danke sehr. It's a real pleasure to be here with you for this fantastic uh, conference. And I would like to tackle with you a very high wall, a very treacherous one, which is the wall of economic crisis. And in order to do that, I will start by discussing a concept which I introduced a couple of years ago, which is about uh, global financial cycles. So our menu for today is uh, to first go through a very, very short history of international capital flows, and then I will uh, talk about the trilemma, the Mandelian trilemma, which is an important idea in international economics, and will bring you into global financial cycles and their link to crisis. Now, it all starts with money. <laughs> and uh, money, as we know, is a medium of exchange. It's a unit of account. It's also a store of value, that is to say something we use to invest uh, in different means. And as we go through time, we started with rather cumbersome means of exchange, as you can see here, somewhere pretty heavy. As we move through history and we move towards recent days, we have gone towards more weightless means of payment, more disembodied means of payment, today even towards digital money, why not? And as we make this journey across time, maybe not surprisingly, we see the number of transactions on international transactions, international capital flows going up. And today we live in a world of high capital flows. Now, mind you, we tend to think that actually, we live in a very specialized world of financial globalization, and it has never happened before. But it is not true. If you go back to the end of the 19th century, and to these great inventions, such as a steam engine and a telegraph, which enabled a lot more communication and movement across the globe, when, in these days, there was already quite a lot of financial globalization. In fact, so much so, that uh, if you go back to Keynes and you, you read what he was writing, just about the period before the First World War, he was telling us, you know, if you live in London, you could order by telephone, sipping your morning tea in bed, the various products of the whole earth, and you could at the same moment and by the same means adventure your wealth in the natural resources and your enterprises of any quarter of the world. So Keynes, was here very pleased about trade globalization, good for the consumer, and also financial globalization, good for the investor. Now, however, this period of financial globalization did not last. And in fact, the Great Depression, the two world wars, took a great toll on financial globalization and so massive decline of international capital flows. Even the post-war period, with the setting up of a new international monetary regime, the Bretton Woods period, didn't see that much in terms of international capital flows, simply because to make the system work, this was a system of fixed exchange rate and convertibility to gold, you actually needed capital controls. So to be fair, in fact, we haven't gone back to levels of financial globalization comparable to the 19th century before the 1980s or the 1990s. But at this point, and I would say from now on, we have really seen truly incredible amount of globalization and much more massive capital flows. Again, we have seen a lot of technological innovation that are behind possibly some of these increase in international transactions. 
But let's take a look at the data. So here is, for example, the amount of investment that the United States makes abroad in different countries. And this is expressed as a percentage of GDP on the vertical axis. So you see we are talking about serious numbers because obviously the GDP of the US is, is a large number. And what is striking, I think, about this data is that they show you that really, up to the 80s, that was still more or less the end of the Bretton Woods period and a little bit after, not much action. After the 80s and the 90s, a pickup in international flows. To me, it looks like a wave, a colorful wave. And the different colors correspond to different types of investment abroad. Look at the other wave, which is the investment of the rest of the world into the United States, again in different types of financial assets. Again, you see this massive increase after the 1990s, and you see that the financial cri crisis made a dent in 2008, but then we went up again. Now, to get an idea about the numbers, maybe a little bit more concretely, let's use our imagination. So imagine that you are the United States, and you have 100 euros in your pocket. This is your GDP, your, your income. And everybody around you, your neighbors, are actually the other countries, the rest of the world. Well, if we go back to the 1960s, out of your 100 euros, you would actually invest only 10 euros in your neighbors. And by the way, they would not invest that much in you, you would invest only 8 euros. Now, fast forward to the 1990s, and actually you would invest 40 euros in your neighbors, they would do about the same. But now at the eve of the financial crisis in 2007, we change order of magnitude. Look at that. We invested 120 euros abroad, and your neighbors invested 140 euros in you. Now, maybe more realistically, imagine you are Germany today. How much do you invest in your neighbors? 250 euros, and they invest about 210 euros in you. That means we are all linked by large cross-border investment. This has some advantages. Keynes thought about some. You know, we can diversify risk. We have these opportunities abroad we can invest in. But this also comes with some problems. And I will just focus on two problems here. When there is an international financial crisis, there is contagion, and shocks propagate themselves. That's one. A second one is that these massive interlinkages can prevent you from conducting independent policies, in particular, using your monetary policy. Now, how does that work? Well, this is where I come to the Mendelian trilemma, which is named after Bob Mandel, a Nobel Prize in Economics. And this trilemma is a simple idea. It says you cannot have these three things at the same time, an independent monetary policy, fixed exchange rate, and free capital movements. They are incompatible. You can have two out of the three, but not the three. That's the trilemma. For example, if you are Hong Kong, and you fix your Hong Kong dollar to the US dollar, and you like capital mobility, you are not going to be able to conduct your independent monetary policy. You are just going to import the monetary policy of the United States. That's all you can do. If you are China in the 1990s and you want a fixed exchange rate, but also an independent monetary policy, you're going to have to use capital controls. This is why the capital account of China is still, to some extent, closed. Now, if we pick an independent monetary policy and free capital movements like the United States and the Eurozone, we have to have a floating exchange rate. This is why we have a dollar-euro float, essentially. Now, that's the what the trilemma is telling you is if you have this combination, a floating exchange rate and free capital movement, you can have an independent monetary policy. It tells you that. And this is the leg of a, of a trilemma that I'm actually going to be challenging. The fact that even with a floating exchange rate, you can actually have an independent monetary policy. I'm going to say, I'm going to show you some data also, telling you that no, actually we are so interdependent via these cross-border financial flows, that this we cannot have either, really. So what is this interdependence that we have been building up? Well, if you look at the data of growth of credit and leverage of large banks and financial intermediaries 
across financial areas, you see that they are very synchronized. If you look at risky asset prices across the world, across continents, in various markets, equity markets, but also corporate bonds prices, you will see that they, they have a very important common component. They move up and down together a lot. If you look at gross financial flows, you will see that they move together into and out of country to a large extent. And this is true across continents. This is also true across, across asset classes. Let me show you data on this. You don't need to see any of these numbers. You just need to see that this is a rather green matrix. Green means the things are moving together. What are these things? These are inflows into various regions of the world, from North America to Africa to Asia, into also different types of assets, so bonds, equity, foreign direct investment, but also bank loans. And you see that all these cells more or less are green, which means that there is a positive correlation across all these flows into all these regions of the world. So, there is synchronization of growth of credit and leverage. There is a lot of co-movements in risky asset prices, also in gross inflows and gross outflows. All of that suggests that there is a global financial cycle. Now, the next question is, where does this come from? What is this global financial cycle? And there, a little bit of econometric analysis suggests that the US monetary policy in particular, so what the Federal Reserve, which is the US central bank, is doing, has a big effect on this global financial cycle. In other words, the tightening of the loosening of the Fed has an effect on the restaking of financial intermediaries in the US, but also in the rest of the world. And this translates through also these capital flows into this global financial cycle. Now, of course, there are also other drivers, which should be made more precise uh, by further research. But what is important to realize is that this global financial cycle applies to countries with fixed exchange rate regime as well as with floating exchange rate regime. Hence, this is a challenge for the Mendelian trilemma that I just described. Does it matter? Well, we have lived through a very important financial crisis, the 2008 crisis, which was in many ways similar to the 1929 crisis and the 30s. Now, both these crises are characterized by a lot of credit growth, one would say excess credit growth, real estate bubbles, asset price valuations which have been exuberant, and then bubble bursting, leading to a very impaired financial system and very deep economic recession, unemployment, and the political consequences that we are still witnessing. Now, if you think of a country which is in a situation in which real estate prices are already buoyant, are already high, like take Spain in 2005 or Ireland in 2005, and on top of that, the global financial cycle is actually in a lenient phase, in a booming phase, well, this cycle may boom may lead to a further boom in asset prices and may fuel asset price bubble to an extent that will lead us to this type of financial crisis that we have lived through since 2008. So it is important to be able to isolate a country from the global financial cycle, and that means that really we do not have a trilemma, but we have a dilemma. If we want in this world with a global financial cycle to have an effective monetary policy, we need additional tools. And what are these additional tools? Well, they could be capital flow management tools, but they could also be what we call now macroprudential tools. And these macroprudential tools are tools which precisely aim at controlling excess credit growth, excess restaking in the financial intermediation sector. Now, if they are used effectively, they can use us, they can, they can help us not to avoid completely crisis, never possible, but to prevent some crises and to make some of them uh, less, less dramatic. So, I think what is very important at this stage is to have further research to help us calibrate these macroprudential tools so that we can really use them to tackle these problems of excess credit growth, booms and bust cycles, 
which have been a feature of the international economy and have conduct and, and has, have, have given some of the worst crises that we have actually lived through. This is not the only thing that we need to do. Hello, Klaus. <laughs> I was just going to tell you that actually there are other things that we really in research in economics should think about tackling. And uh, for example, this is going to interest you a lot, as I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Because we do need to think about systemic risk and uh, financial intermediation a little bit more. You cannot bribe me like that. <laughs> <laughs> But also, uh, we, we do need to put a little bit more research in fiscal optimization and offshore financial flows, even less, even less. So the <laughs> <laughs> these are really the walls we need and want to tear down. Thank you very much. <laughs>